Hello and welcome to the It's Flooded workshop. Uh, it's one of the first workshops of this uh, uh, conference. And uh, as we are meeting here, there is uh, another one going on simultaneously in Arabic. So welcome to all of you. And um, we hope that others will join in as soon as possible, but we will begin the proceedings of this workshop. My name is Aparna Tannan, and I am uh, here together with uh, Mohana Chakravarti. And the two panelists today uh, uh, are with us. Uh, Kiara and uh, Francoise, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for in the introduction. I'm Chiara, I'm a researcher at the University of Florence and I'm working on flood risk analysis and I'm also teaching hydrolo hydrology and hydraulics at the university. Okay, uh, Francoise, Neo, you're next. Hello, uh, my name is Francoise. I, I am a scientific contributor in uh, IRPA, Royal Institute for Cultural Heritage of Belgium. Uh, and I've been in charge of coordinating the uh, heritage sector um, committee for the last flooded last uh, year in, in Belgium. Okay, thank you. Thank you, um, Francoise, for that introduction. Uh, I think uh, without further ado, uh, we will just um, start our um, workshop. I think. Uh, I think we'll just just begin and not wait for the others to join us and as they join us because we're running out of time. So we have a very short window of time in which we would like to discuss with all of the participants here the reasons, uh, the first of all, the relation between climate change and the flood risk and how climate change is impacting flooding or the risk of flooding. And uh, then the next, uh, we will learn uh, about a very innovative project uh, in Italy, uh, which is a case study uh, shared by Chiara. And following that, uh, we will also look at uh, mitigation measures. How are we to, how can we mitigate? Uh, what do we know about mitigation and what are our gap areas? Which are the kind of kinds of actors and stakeholders that we need to, um, involved in mitigating the risk of floods for heritage and people. And then after that, uh, we will have um, a small, so we have uh, a small interactive uh, uh, activity, um, activity in which uh, we will try to share some tools with you for assessing uh, damage and risk after floods. So with that, uh, uh, without further ado, I would like to share my uh, presentation with you to begin with. And uh, let me just see. Uh, okay, so there's a schedule uh, which Mohuna is sharing with you. She's my facilitator, uh, co-facilitator with me. Both of us have planned this workshop together. And uh, first allow me to share my screen and um, can just uh, begin. So these are just some thoughts I put together, uh, flooding. And uh, th as the title says itself, it's flooded. Why is flooding happening? And this, these are just, this is just a snapshot that we are, uh, uh, that I got from the EM that, which is the International Disaster Database. And this is, these are the first uh, two weeks of January. And we've already had, uh, you know, uh, in this, uh, you can see there are about uh, four flood incidents that we've had around the world. And we, I'm, I'm very happy to see that we have a colleague joining from Indonesia. And uh, there are also colleagues here who have experienced uh, the worst kind of flooding uh, in history in Europe recently. And I see uh, there are colleagues from Germany and uh, of course, uh, Francoise is here. So we are uh, going to discuss types of flooding. And we all know about coastal flooding. We all have experienced to some extent, and we've been reading, all of us have been reading a lot about climate change and river flooding and flash flooding and ground water flooding and drain and sewer flooding. So 
it's basically uh, one of the uh, as as uh, I'm sorry, I have I think I have the closed captioning. Can everybody see closed captioning in my uh, screen sharing? Yeah, we were able to see that. Okay, so how do I get rid of this closed captioning? Okay, sorry. So very quickly, I just wanted to uh, go through the types of flooding that we are encountering more and more. So uh, one area of concern, if we look at data, is uh, the flash flooding or groundwater flooding uh, and then drain and sewer. And sometimes in cities, it's uh, all three, a combination of all three that is happening. And uh, climate change is accelerating that as we uh, are, plus also our human activities. And as in cities, uh, we are drilling more and more, and uh, that is causing land subsidence and uh, you know lowering of the ground. And uh, there is also activities like oil and gas mining or the tectonics or the sometimes the factor of liquefaction. So there are not enough data to uh, clearly uh, link climate change with flooding, uh, the risk of flooding, but the, uh, whatever we have is really uh, pointing to two aspects. And that is that uh, the uh, climate change is definitely increasing the uh, you know, heavy rain, intense rainfalls, and the infrastructures within cities is not coping um, the drainage systems are, uh, or the you know the flood draining uh, drainage area and all are not working enough to, uh, and there are you know uh, also our um, sewers and our sewage system and all are not able to cope up with the amount of uh, rainfall that is happening, and plus there is also the um, uh, degradation of the soil, uh, which is again linked to our own activities. So uh, this is something that, and also we are, uh, the other factor is uh, that uh, urban flooding is becoming more frequent because uh, there, uh, the, we are adding impervious services so the water cannot be absorbed. For, so th for example, this is a map of Washington DC within 10 years, there was a 26% rise of uh, impervious, impervious surface, surfaces. Uh, so that the water cannot go down and cannot uh, trickle down. So these are some of the reasons uh, why uh, urban flooding is happening more and what we are seeing. Oh, I'm not sharing the screen. Oh, you didn't tell me. Okay, I'm so sorry about this. Uh, you should have told me before. Uh, so again, sorry. Uh, this is the map of Washington DC. And I think before that I had uh, just that picture so that you can see different reasons why we are experiencing urban flooding. So coastal flooding, we have, everybody thinks that I'm near the coast, so okay, my flood risk is high. I'm near the river, my flood risk is high. But what about urban flooding? And that I think is something that we have to think about, especially now that uh, uh, we, as our cities, as we are urbanizing very fast and developments are happening very fast. And uh, we, are, uh, we are really putting stress on the, the infrastructure for water drainages under stress. And uh, also we do not have very good risk assessments. So that is why Kiara's uh, presentation will be very useful to understand what, uh, how they are uh, through this Movida project in Italy uh, and involving certain stake stakeholders, how they have been uh, looking at uh, risk assessment for the flood risk in historic cities. I have a video to share, which I think is, uh, let me see if I can, uh, I should have played it before. I don't think so. I can play play the video. Uh, I think we will straight away move to Kiara's uh, uh, presentation, and after that, uh, I will bring you back to this presentation. So I think uh, over to Kiara. Thank you. 
Chiara, can you just explain to us more about risk assessment uh, in your context, especially with the Movida project? Yes, of course, I'm <clears throat> sharing my screen. Okay, so I'm sharing today with you um, this uh, the experience of the Movida project and the part I was responsible in was the assessment of flood impacts to cultural heritage in the Po River catchment. So let me first uh, show you what is our study area. Our study area, uh, as you can see from the right map, is the north of Italy. This is the old uh, Po River uh, District Authority territory. And it is about 90,000 square kilometers of territory. And there are nine regions, uh, nine Italian regions, and also part of France. And in this uh, catchment, there are about uh, 20 million uh, inhabitants. There are several rivers which compose the river network, uh, about 140 important tributaries to the Po River. And in the Movida project, we uh, had to understand different uh, damage mechanisms and we were trying to um, quantify the potential damages of river flooding to all the possible uh, exposed assets. And this um, is, an is, a, is a task that all the European countries have to uh, achieve according to the European Flood Directive, which asks the country to issue a flood risk management plan. And in order to manage flood risk, we need, first of all, to understand what is our risk. So in this, um, in this project that involved uh, about 10 universities, um, I worked specifically on the um, inclusion of cultural heritage into this flood risk management plan. And this was not, um, it was, it's the first time that is uh, achieved because before uh, this project, cultural heritage was just seen as an extra item only exposed but without uh, a sort of quantification of potential losses. So um, this slide uh, quickly summarizes our workflow in this project. So first of all, in order to understand the uh, exposure and quantify the number of cultural heritage uh, potentially exposed uh, to floods, we performed a long GIS data collection so we browsed in different um, geodatabases and regional and national repositories to find georeference um, information about the presence of cultural heritage. So <clears throat> here I'm talking about tangible cultural heritage, so everything that is built or buildings. And in this collection of different types of geographic data, we had to check their quality, there were some position mistakes, and we had to harmonize all the information related to these georeference points. Then after this uh, first part of the work, we built one huge uh, cultural heritage georeference database. And then our second step was to classify the type of cultural heritage. So according to the description that were attached or some names of the items, we were able to identify 10 different types of uh, cultural structures. So for instance, religious architectures or residences, museums, archeological sites and so forth. And for each of them, um, we also associated the uh, level of protection uh, to which these um, cultural items are subject to. And some cultural items are worldwide renowned and protected, like the UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Others are protected and classified at national level, and others are recognized only at local or regional level. So in our um, attempt to make priorities, uh, we decided that um, the importance of UNESCO World Heritage Sites was much higher 
than national heritage and also this national heritage was more important than local heritage. So this was a sort of uh, prioritization of our value of cultural heritage. And on the other side, we wanted to classify these uh, items according to their potential vulnerability. So the expected degree of damage in case of floodings. And based on um, our knowledge of the main typologies and structural components of these kind of assets, we classified four different uh, typology based on vulnerability. So for instance, religious architecture, residences, castles, and museums were considered the most vulnerable because they have special um, building characteristics. Uh, there are often pieces of furnitures or artworks inside. So we expect that these uh, classes um, will have higher damages in case of floodings. On the opposite side, for instance, open spaces like um, squares or parks would have lower uh, vulnerability. So in this way, with this classification, we um, basically classify the potential impact with a sort of weight that here in this table is called WI. So for each class of exposure and vulnerability, we have uh, a degree, uh, a normalized degree of impact. So for instance, the black, the black squares have the highest impact. And then uh, for uh, all our territory, which is a huge territory, as I show you, we um, classified the risk and the potential damage in terms of uh, this uh, variable, which is called IUBC, which is an index which quantifies in a portion of territory the density of this potential damage, so the density in terms of um, the area that is flooded. So uh, just to show you uh, some key results of our project, uh, we started our project with a unique geodatabase with about 60,000 points. And then after our work, we almost doubled the number of known cultural items in our territory. So we reached about 125,000 items recognized and classified. Then these uh, points were intersected with the inundation maps. Uh, inundation maps are uh, geographic uh, data which show us the extent and magnitude of different types of flood according to their probability. And um, we came up with about uh, 38,000 cultural heritage structure exposed to floods in present climate that you can see on the right map. And for them, um, we have, of course, different shades of potential flood impacts. And uh, at the local level, so in small portion of significant risk as defined by the River District Authority, we applied our uh, geographic uh, specialization. So each portion of the territory has a color which corresponds to the severity of flood damages uh, to cultural heritage. So for instance, in this map, the red and purple areas are those where the concentration of cultural buildings or the damages as are associated to them are particularly significant. And in this map, uh, we can identify uh, three uh, damage hotspots. Uh, the bottom one is the city of Modena, where we have uh, the cathedral, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And this kind of uh, mapping and specialization of uh, flood impacts uh, to cultural heritage is performed on the whole uh, district. And this, uh, together with all the other exposed assets that were quantified, like residential buildings, economic activities, infrastructure, Chiara, Chiara, may, will Chiara, be... Chiara, may I, may I just, sorry to interrupt you. Yes. So if you can uh, just explain us um, in this map, uh, in relation to the river basin and the, you know, um, like which are the low-lying areas and can you, can you just a little bit like, why did you 
uh, again explain why did you choose these to be the hot spots uh, i understand stood the point about the density but what is the other reason why these uh, red spots are appearing can you explain a little bit more yes uh, the red spots are, are on one hand those where we have more cultural buildings or those cultural buildings are particularly important and vulnerable so where we have the red or purple areas it means that we have a lot of cultural heritage or a very significant cultural heritage all this area that i'm showing you is flooded so all this colored area, which is around this uh, blue line, which is one of the Four River tributary, is flooded. Mm -hmm. But in the whole territory, we have different uh, density of cultural heritage because not all the territory is covered by this type of asset. So for mm -hmm. instance, in the white areas, there are no uh, cultural buildings. In the uh, yellow areas, maybe there are some locally protected objects like rural architectures which are expected to suffer less than a religious building for instance mm -hmm. so when the stakeholders the regional authorities and the district authority have to plan which areas need to be prioritized for the mitigation measures they know that there are some specific hotspots for cultural heritage okay. together so my, with all the other potential losses. So, so topographically speaking, and my other, other question is that here, when these red spots have been identified, there's only a uh, river flooding that is uh, identified. There's no other form of flooding that can happen here. No, this is just river flooding because uh, the district okay. authorities are managing all the river flooding and All coastal flooding if there is a coastline okay so uh, this is this is the point that i wanted to highlight for those who are watching with us from the beginning uh, that uh, okay go ahead please yes i was concluding that this kind of um, geographic information is useful for risk informed decision making and planning and design of the mitigation measures that for rivers um, there are specific mitigation measures such as the retention basins or levees, dikes, and of course, non-structural mitigation measures such as emergency and preparedness plan that can be better um, targeted with this kind of uh, mapping at the catchment level. This is uh, the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you so much. Um, I We open the floor for questions before I take you back to my own presentation. And also because many others have joined us since Chiara started. Thank you for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, mm, can we have some questions from our participants? No questions so far? You can unmute yourselves. Seems no questions. So if there are no questions, then I'll go back to my presentation. Okay. Uh, please feel free to use the chat function to uh, also register your questions if you have uh, along the course of this. Uh, so I'll start sharing my screen again. And uh, so what Chiara was just saying, uh, we were, until before others joined us, we were looking at flooding as a risk and how uh, global warming is uh, putting more, um, like uh, there's increased pre pre precipitation in the, um, and, and also uh, we have uh, intense rainfalls. And uh, at the same time, we were discussing that uh, there can be river flooding, there can be coastal flooding, but there's also the danger of flash flooding, which is increasing. And there is the groundwater flooding, when, which is a more slow, slower kind of flooding, which can happen because of ground, groundwater rising up slowly over time and with a much uh, long period of rain. And then there is the drain and sewer flooding. And in urban context, we can see a combination of all this because of also having impervious membranes. 
and, and uh, surfaces. And uh, it is very important to do a risk assessment like the one that Kiara has just pointed out through her case study. And in this case, Kiara, if you can just explain what were the kind of stakeholders, who, what, uh, this Movida project, who were the stakeholders who participated in it and how your university was a participant. Can you explain a little bit? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Well, um, the stakeholders, well, the, the project was funded by the Po River District Authority, which is the uh, authority which um, has the task to issue the flood risk management plan and covers the whole territory I show you. But this kind of um, project has also different stakeholders, which are the regional authorities and local authorities who then have to uh, design they have first to prioritize the prevention measures against flood, and then they have to design according to the regulations in our country. They have to design where to uh, build some um, like dikes or retention basins to protect their territory. And then, of course, there are several uh, stakeholders which can use this kind of maps with like the civil protection and all the local authorities who are working on the territory planning also the municipalities who have to plan where to develop a new district in the city or a new neighborhood have to take care of this kind of maps but have you ever seen cultural heritage institutions going out and seeking this kind of development plans and uh, you know from the city we, in our project we involved also the regional secretariat of the ministry of culture that helped us to um, validate with their expert judgment the classification of vulnerability that we made um, of course several institutions are involved when the authorities discuss the feasibility of prevention measures. So when we decide to build something or to design something, then there is a participatory and open process also toward the citizens and all the different stakeholders which are put together to evaluate if it's feasible or not. Okay. But at this stage for just for maps, it was uh, a group of universities and the district authority who then has to like communicate to all the stakeholders the results of their assessment. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you for that insight. I'm uh, going to just uh, now again share my screen and uh, bring back to the presentation that I was uh, going to make. So I'm just going to show a video and then I'm going to- uh, Every thunderstorm begins with a single raindrop, but trillions can Am follow I sharing my and all Sorry. that yes. water rushes okay. down. The early makings of a disaster, and it doesn't need to be raining where you are. A street like this in a valley can funnel the water, creating a dangerous setup for a flash flood. Heavy rainfall is the main ingredient in flash flooding. Other factors include building in a flood zone, improper drainage, and ground that's just too wet and can't absorb any more water. And this happens fast. Now look at the street. The water is business to business here, wall to wall. Whoa, what's this guy doing? And this water is about six inches now, and it's enough to stall vehicles, even float vehicles. In some cases, you're gonna lose control and you don't wanna be this guy. So if you come to a street that's flooded, turn around, don't drown. More than half of the deaths from flooding each year occur in vehicle. And the water's still rising here. In fact, it's enough to flow pretty much anything away that's not bolted down at two feet. It's gonna carry away uh, even cars like this. Oh my gosh, look at this. This is an SUV and the water is high enough now to carry SUVs and pickup trucks. And this water is well inside these businesses. And this is scary, this is bad. That's not good to see something like that. We're talking some immense destruction with the force of this water. It can carry debris for miles, entire trees. In fact, water flowing at just 10 miles an hour can produce the same force as winds blowing at 300 miles. An hour. Okay, so this was just a teaser that we wanted to share with you. Uh, I'll still uh, continue with my PowerPoint uh, and uh, move on to the next slide. So I don't know, okay, yeah. Uh, the idea was to basically introduce this other type of flooding that we are going to likely to see more and more. And this brings me to the point 
and we're going to move very quickly between concepts and we are using the terms again and again. One term we are using is mitigation. Another term we are using is exposure and vulnerability. So we'll be uh, later on, we have a kit to share with all of you. You can have a look at it. And we have the standard uh, standardized disaster terminology in that kit that we are going to share with you. Uh, so we, if we are worried about cultural heritage in cities where, which are not near uh, water bodies and where urban flooding could take place, how are we going to assess the risk? And I think that is the uh, main problem here because the case study that Kiara has shown is about a uh, river flooding. And uh, there are, as she said, there are studies that are being carried out. What we need to do is we need to work with our urban planning de uh, development departments in our cities to understand and to carry out risk assessments to see if we, or if we have a heritage site, uh, any one of us who's working in the heritage sector, if these sites can be flooded. And so that risk assessment is very important. And once we have done that risk assessment, it's important then to mitigate and involve, uh, which means involving proactive measures to prevent or minimize the potential impacts on cultural heritage. Uh, you know, so what, what measures we can take uh, to prevent flooding in our uh, the different, uh, you know, heritage sites, uh, be it a site, be it a museum. And we have to really look at these layers, basically, uh, which was very well introduced by Kiara. She introduced the region level layer. And also uh, then we have to dive into site, you know, specific single sites, single buildings. And then from buildings, we have to progress into rooms, storage and display units, packaging of, I'm not sharing again. Oh, sorry. And just maybe we can take one question we have in the chat for Kiara. Yeah. Yeah, we still can't see your screen, ma'am. Uh, while you share, we can do the question. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Kiara. Maybe you can answer in person. Yes, I was <laughs> I was writing in the chat, but anyway, this uh, matrix that we used um, is a weighted sum of the potential losses to cultural heritage and divided by the surface area, which in our case is a particularly uh, land parcel, which is the census um, census polygons, which is uh, which cover the whole territory. So it is a measure of intensity of the of the loss to cultural heritage, and this was uh, specifically introduced for our project because um, for cultural heritage we are not able to quantify in monetary terms the loss. Uh, with respect to other sectors, such as the residential sectors where uh, the state of art is well advanced and we are able to quantify the, the cost to restore or to replace uh, a bridge or a residential house, uh, it is more difficult to quantify in monetary terms the, the loss to cultural heritage. So we use this kind of intensity measure based on uh, a weighted sum of all the cultural items in a certain portion of territory. So it's a sort of uh, quantitative because it quantitative measure because it's weighted and it's ranked among different classes, but it's still qualitative because it's not uh, a measure in dollars or euros. And yeah. it could be used also for other types of uh, hazards like coastal flooding or uh, uh, earthquakes or any type or of even earthquake. urban flooding if we were to do a urban flooding yes. urban flooding as well if we have the the inundation the hazard map for the urban flooding yes yes and that's the point uh, we were uh, making so very quickly i just want to uh, move you to this uh, all those who are uh, because now we are going to move to a jam board uh, to, to an activity very shortly so I just wanted to share this uh, idea with you uh, that we start with the region, look at the site, the building, room, storage, display units. So if we are if we have the collections level, and then packaging, support, and objects. So these are the levels in which we have to think about mitigation. 
and uh, also like uh, protecting uh, from inundation and flooding. And uh, if we move on to look at this, uh, this is just an uh, example from a temple in India, um, which is a world heritage site and how uh, water pools in there uh, because of the development around the temple, the slopes have changed and uh, it's a case of urban flooding and heavy rain combination where um, the water just pools in, uh, the slope has changed and so water comes in. So how the water comes into your site, which is the risk path, which are the areas it's going to uh, gush in from, is it's very important to understand because only then one can take mitigation measures. So the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, uh, the level of Kiara's case study that she has shown you with the mapping and able to understand risk and uh, you know the how the which are the hot spots. But then after that, what needs to be done is that the individual site level it needs to be understand how water will come in in order to arrest uh, you know, it from flooding or to protect that area from flooding or to mitigate the impact or to reduce the impacts of flooding. So I think this is something uh, we need to keep in mind as we are uh, going to encounter more and more flooding. Uh, here's just some uh, you know, um, stakeholders that I have listed that uh, we need to involve when we are thinking of uh, uh, doing mitigation for flood risk for heritage sites or uh, museums, collections, archives. And with this, I think what we can do is uh, we can, I can move, give, uh, give the floor to Mohona and we, uh, she can explain the, uh, the activity that we have planned for you which we can, I think, together share. The idea is that uh, I would encourage all of you to unmute your mics, show your faces in camera put, so that we can have an interactive discussion and uh, we can really uh, exchange ideas about what all, what, how we have experienced flooding. If we haven't experienced it directly, what do we know about flood risk and to exchange knowledge and build uh, you know, some, identify some gaps together. So I really invite all of you to join in the next phase, which is go going to, uh, we, we have really uh, designed it for interaction. So I hope all of you will join in. Okay, I'll just stop sharing. And so over to Mohona to share her screen and uh, the activity. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, do this small activity together in the plenary. I will take you to a city Mona, we, you, we're losing your audio. Can you hear me now? I yes. got disconnected, sorry. Yeah. Okay, so as I was saying, I will take you to Bel Air City. Uh, this is the area that we will be working in. Uh, this is the city center of the city. This city experiences heavy rainfall, almost 75 mm in two hours when there is the rain, rainy season. And so as you can see from the data, in a very short time, it experiences uh, a huge intensity of rainfall. Uh, at a site level, we will be dealing with the city center, as I said, so we have the National Museum here and very close to it, we have a river. It's a site section of the, of the city center and we can see that it is situated in a low lying area. It is close to the river and this part of the city is under the water level. The city also has a population of 3 million people. As I mentioned before, the flood, uh, the, the river is clo very close to the city and the river bank is eroded. The sewage system, the drain, uh, drain pipes, they are all blocked, they are not maintained regularly. Uh, this is the city center where we have three very important buildings. One, we have the church, 
we have a museum and we have a city hall. This is the museum and this is the condition of the museum. Uh, as you can see, the entrance is from the ground level. We have uh, some landscape around which are not uh, very well maintained. Uh, there is heavy traffic around the museum at all times. Then moving on to the city hall, it's a heritage building which is now used as a public office. Again, heavy traffic around some infrastructure uh, that are not always functioning properly. And we have the circle church. Now, zooming into the collection level. So if you noticed, we, we went from the site level to the building level and now to the collection level. So in the museum, we have very important uh, wooden uh, exhibits. We have a piano, which the community relates to, and they, they come to see these collections. We have very old furnitures, which are also wooden. We have some interactive devices for the museum. We have displays that are quite uh, low height. While in the city hall, we have important books, documents, wooden furnitures, and so on. And in the circle church, as you can see, we have marble uh, sculptures, we have the wooden altar furnitures. So uh, over to you, Aparnam, if you want to explain yeah, that. Yeah. So, so you, I hope you remembered, this is the city of Bel Air. It's a fictitious city. Uh, and uh, we made it up. But the idea is that we want to see how together we can plan mitigation for this, these three buildings that uh, Mohona has shown uh, um, to you. And we have 50,000 uh, know, dollars for planning your mitigation at a city site and building and collection level, right? So uh, let's, let's, let's start playing this game. And uh, it would be really interesting if I start getting answers from you because this way it would be uh, great. So we're going to start with the, um, as we said in the beginning, uh, Mohuna, if you can take at the beginning uh, slide where you are showing the, you know, yes. So this is the site level. It has an eroded river bank. It has blocked drains and sewers. And uh, now let's take it back, uh, take it all the way like forward to the game because I, I just want people to remember maybe, you know, to move back yeah. and forth so that- and uh, Also so, remember the low-lying area. So yeah, the and the low-lying area. So if you see, if you've seen the low-lying area, so we have these three sites in a low-lying area. You've seen now the eroded river bank. You have seen the blocked sewers. And now let's move to the mitigation at site level. So you've just heard Kiara and you've done, uh, so what would be, your first step, you have only $50,000. What would you do at the site level if you people were in charge here? And which actors you will consult? Any, any takers? I see we have something on the chat. Daniela, you can also unmute yourself and please- Yes, please unmute yes. yourself and yeah, yeah. Just join in because otherwise this is going to become very painful for us. Mm -hmm. I think that the first things that we have to do is to better investigate the intensity of the flood that is expected. So uh, we need to know which is uh, the duration of the flood that is expected, the water depth that will be reached within each site, and uh, the velocity, the contamination, and so on. So having an idea of which are the impacts that we expect on the free sites before taking any kind so of... So basically doing a risk assessment. Yeah, a hazard assessment, yes, basically. A hazard, a hazard assessment as well as a risk assessment, right? Like exposure, vulnerability, everything, right? Yes, of course. Yeah. yeah. This is the best things that we uh, we have to do is to better understand the problem. Yeah, and who will you uh, contact here? Um, in, uh, well, hydraulic engineers or uh, experts mm -hmm. in uh, damage assessment in general. Yeah. We also have Erica who would like to add something. Yes, Erica. Uh, yeah, I think I will. <clears throat> this is just uh, some small things, but I think I will will talk to to people working at the site and see if they can 
uh, help t with information where they have had problems with flooding in the buildings uh, before, because I can at least see that some museums we come to, they see that they have repeatedly coming water in in some places. So I will ask people that works there now and have worked there before. And I think also one very, <laughs> I think kind of easy thing to do is uh, to move things in the lower part of the building or at the floor up to shelves or up to, to hold, something. Hold, hold the thought because we, we are moving to the collection level. Okay, this, okay, this we take that later. Level. later, later. Is, okay. So, so here are, you know, these photos are, uh, Mona, can you explain what are these photos? Huh? So that uh, some options you have here. Okay. Okay, so these were some clues Let's... that we kind of kept aside for you to take a hint. Uh, at a site level, what you can do is, of course, catchment areas. So these are uh, these are small pockets of water bodies which grabs the which takes the water in from uh, running down from a higher level. So usually nowadays, because of developments, these catchment areas are getting blocked. So that's why it's increasing the floods. But if there is, there are pockets of water bodies, there are pockets of green spaces, soft spaces, which can absorb the water, you will reduce the intensity. So here is an example of the catchment area, which is, you can consider. We also have levees, which are usually used for low lying areas. So in this case, it's quite applicable. Uh, these are mounds, which are uh, built around a site uh, that you are dealing with, and then it blocks the water coming again downstream. Uh, zooming in, we also have, of course, maintaining gutters, maintaining the sewage lines, again, a good option for this particular case, and soft paving, because nowadays we put hard pavings everywhere in landscape planning and in buildings and everywhere we have hard, hardscapes, which means that there is no potential for any water to go underground. So it runs off. So that's why this is also a, a good option at a site level. And of course, the actor that you can consult is the urban planning department, architects, engineers. Yeah. So now anybody uh, amongst our group has a, has a direct example of doing something like this? I think we had Miss Ina who wanted to contribute and also yes. Miss Ashwini has written something in the chat. Okay, okay. so Ina and uh, first Ina and then Ashwini. Right. Uh, I just wanted to say the same, that you have to consult the city officials of the maintenance, uh, for example, of the rivers. Um, for example, I work in the museum which is close to the river and we, if we have, have strong tropical rain, uh, and it's not cleaned properly, we are overflooded. So you have to really keep close to city officials. I don't know which kind of departments are responsible that um, the- But you uh, know example, in your own context, you know in your own context, the departments, right? Yes, uh, I think that you have to, it is, if we are talking about levels, we depends on the uh, officials which taking care of the rivers, and the draining of the waters and so on, because we cannot do it by ourselves. So we have to do kind of fiscalization. I don't, I don't have uh, the example that we do that, uh, but uh, uh, I think that maybe uh, we, we always say that we have to keep close to this kind of uh, institution, um, public institution who take care of that. But I think it's very important. Okay, thank you. Uh, and then uh, Ashwini. Um, hello. Uh, so like I said in the chat, I would say one of the most important mitigation step would be a riverbank restoration by green infrastructure such as swales and wetlands. Uh, and that could be with the, uh, that would be with the help of uh, urban uh, like planners, city planners, and maybe even the citizens of the city so that they have an ownership with these green infrastructures and they could visit them for some cultural experiences. Okay, so uh, the question here is building good relationships and I'm going to leave it at that because we, we have a lot to cover uh, and uh, making sure that we know the people who are working at a site level to in, 
to undertake these kind of mitigation. So out of 50,000, how much have you spent right now? Can anybody give me a guess? Is all your money spent or do you have some left? No? no From what is left or not, we also have Miss Alessandra who has yes. said uh, that at an urban landscape level, one of the solutions is slow the flow of water, which is at yeah. building level to build flood barriers and pumps to use resilient materials. Indeed. So that's something... Uh, very good uh, suggestion. Yeah, out of budget, Aparna. Out of budget. <laughs> <Completely>. <laughs> <laughs> no more budget left for anything. Let's move to the next level and try to find, uh, you know, and then, then look at our options. Just, yes? I just wanted to say that this kind of measures like maintenance of the rivers are ex extremely uh, expensive. Costful. So, so we probably will not be able to spend uh, just maintenance around the building. So it is really important to make conscious the officials and the public of importance, this kind of mess investment, but I think $50,000 will not be enough. <laughs> yes, <laughs> at all, yes. at all. Totally, totally, totally. And that's why I wanted to just, you know, because this is the, this is our realistic situation. This is what each institution is perhaps has, perhaps not even that, right? When we are thinking of mitigating floods, right? So we really have to build partnerships to be able to do something or to be effective. And that's the key, right? Oh no, this group is very quiet. Okay. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. The only way. Only way, only way. Let's move on. Let's move on to the next level. Okay, this level, I'm sure I'm gonna get many, many, and there are lots of hints here. So uh, a, a bit of what Alessandra was also saying uh, about flood barriers. And uh, so what can we do at a building level if the flood is going to come to you at a building level? And Francois, you can jump into, but you have a pr presentation that doesn't mean we, it stops you from uh, you know, participating. Okay. So I see Samuel, I see many people who could actually contribute to this discussion. So what would you do at a building level to mitigate floods? Chiara has raised her hands. Okay, Chiara. Yes, just a quick suggestion. At the building level, I think some of these uh, mitigation strategies you are suggesting with this picture much depend on the type of flooding you are expecting. If you have okay. time to arrange this kind of sandbags or uh, barriers, because you have a warning system and you have enough time to prepare, then it is safe to apply them. If you have a flash flood, you do not have enough time to put on these barriers. So probably okay. they are more suitable for a river flood when you have some warning system and have six hours, 12 hours to arrange this kind of setting. Uh, yes, and actually if you have done your assessment well in that first step, then you probably would know that you this is an area that is likely to flood or have flash flooding. Uh, like uh, I can share, show another video of, uh, again, it's, it's from US. I don't know why the, so many videos are from US, but uh, okay. So very good point, very good point. I see Erica, then I see Alessandra, Alessandra, and then Erica. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> yeah, I think this, um, the, um, suggestion that you made with this slide, uh, slide is uh, really, really important. But also I think we should think about uh, the solution that allows the water in, because sometimes you cannot keep the water out of the buildings. So it's really matter, it, what it matters is build that awareness of the building users about that there is a risk of flooding. And so adapt the buildings to have like being exposed to this risk. And what I mean is like use material, for example, on the ground floor that are easy to clean and that are easy to like substitute that are like more resilient. And as someone was saying before, like raise the socket, electric socket at like um, one meter or so like one meter and a half. So there is not like a problem in the electric system. Adapt, like put all the valuables like object 
on the upper floor. So built really a certain solution that uh, um, expect the water to enter to the building because uh, as a, um, a lot of flooding like as shows that uh, like uh, water will enter in the building is something it's really difficult to keep the water out. So we use the breathable material, for example, no cement render on heritage uh, um, assets, like all these kind of things that uh, are more resilient and uh, allow the material to recover quickly. Thank you. Great, great. Thank you so much for this very valuable insight. It's really, um, uh, okay. So next I, I see Erica and then Ina. I think also okay, important to have routines, both for, for kind of maintenance the building. So you have had that you have, you know, in the autumn, we have at least a lot of leaves coming down to the roof and you have to take care of that. So have routines for maintenance of these kind of things, uh, but also routines when there is a water, weather warning, or for example, in my town, there was a weather warning last weekend and they said that it would be stormy, then you have to kind of fix things to the ground. You don't can't have a lot of things in your garden. So have a routine for what will happening when the weather forecast says that there will come a lot of water. Maybe you should have a sand sex, maybe you should do something, but a routine what to do before and not to stand there in the middle of it. Exactly, exactly. But what do you do with the churches or these large buildings that are not lived in? You know, there are heritage sites, but they have very little staff with them. So what do you do for that? Do you have any suggestions for mitigation measures in these kind of situations? And I see, uh, okay, uh, yeah, go ahead. Do you, do you want me to answer it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, th I think at least where I live, I think the owner of the building is responsible for it. But I think also that's also a thing in a plan to have who is taking care of that and who will uh, who will do something when they have a weather forecast for very bad weather. Uh, I think that's kind of important to, to agree on before and not in the middle of the night. Not in the middle of the yeah, now save me, that type of thing. I see a lot of uh, going in chat. So Juhi, you can uh, perhaps help to read out uh, Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, we have from Daniela that we must adopt dry proofing and wet proofing solutions, but with historical site, this is not always feasible, of course. Of course. And um, Francoise has said that to keep energy sources available and so out of floodable zones, but close to them, whether local electric powers or fuels for pumps, etc. And also that when there's a flood, we must keep an eye on the weather forecast because floods can happen twice within hours, days, and weeks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we also have with us, uh, until now, I thought I, it was, I just saw Ziva. Uh, Ziva, do you have any, any comments? Hello. It's good to see you here. He's not here. Uh, I just had some comment. Uh, yes. Uh, that I need, uh, I think that's very important, the point one, to do risk assessment, but also plan, because all other things are kind, has to be in this plan, and it has to be minimal written document, I think, uh, because if you, which kind of known by users, because if you don't have a plan, um, which is known by user, all these kind of mitigations will be kind of uh, lost maybe and not activated in the right moment. So I think it has to be a plan which is uh, known by users. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you on that because otherwise no mitigation measure without the user, right? It's all human activity as, as also, I think Erica was also trying to say there's something similar, uh, plan and as well as routine, right? So plan and then to be implemented in a routine. And I think these are the elements of uh, good mitigation. And thank you for that. Uh, again, I think a very important point, Daniela. I think we should move on to the next level. So we uh, 50,000 uh, is not enough. Huh? <laughs> this, is, uh, this is just uh, getting up very soon. Consumed already. I can see some of it. So now looking at uh, building level. And this is how it looks like. So what would you do here? What would you do in the storage? Yeah, if water gets in here, I think the showcases are okay. It's me again. I don't know if, if there is a line, <laughs> but I think yeah. emergency kit, it's very important that you have kind of emergency 
uh, to mitigate emergency. So it has to be kit available, easily available to to quick response. But but tell me how much you would put in that? Like uh, it depends, no? Like how much material you will put in an emergency kit? Because sometimes you see these emergency kits; they're ridiculous. Like you have one jacket, one 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 helmet, one one flashlight, one something. But the inundation could be very large. So how do you how do you plan for a large event or something like if it's going to get bigger and bigger? Like the kind of the flash flood video which we saw. Yes, uh, this kind of, co of course, of emergency, well, it's not possible that you are, uh, if it's flood and it's lots of water, your institution cannot respond. But I talk about our problems, which is tropical rain. So we have this uh, vacuum cleaner for water. So it can aspire quickly water. This is in our kits. And then this kind of abs high absorbent material, it's very important. And then the tools, like I don't know what is in English, to carry out a way of water. So this kind we have this kind of boxes, and uh, this it is with this kind of materials which will uh, make us able to remove like thirty liters of water, fifty liters of water. Uh, I think this is kind of quantification you have to do. Uh, what, how much water do you want uh, to remove in how many how much time? Okay. From okay. where and from where? From where is where? water coming from? Exactly, because then you now need to understand the building level, uh, you know, vulnerabilities and try to understand. I see Erika going, a hand going up, and I see Kiara. Yes, I I would like to share the experience we have in Florence for all the museums and cultural heritage. We have some teams that are trained to move um, artworks and objects to upper floors with respect to the uh, inundation level. So if we have some, let's say six to 12 hours in advance and we have flood warning, we can start moving uh, artworks to upper levels. But for those um, artworks which are heavy or cannot be displaced during the, these times, we have some automatic system that rise the objects up to the roof, basically, or we can also put some uh, waterproof um, ceilings on heavy objects such as statues. Statues are usually not so vulnerable yes. because they, if they are in marble, for instance, they are not damaged, but uh, you can protect them with a co waterproof coat very very uh, so yeah exactly and for books also for the national library we have in florence the books that are stored in underground uh, and basement levels are always uh, stored in sealed plastic bags so in case they are already sealed in case of flood but great that's a, these are very good uh, mitigation measures and thank you for sharing. And I see Erica going and going up and then Fra Fra Francoise. Uh, yeah, I think I was a little bit into the same uh, to move up. I think I think I've gone to many museums where they say just when they have the flood, but then they have had things on the floor. <laughs> and I think it's always a coincidence that they at least just that moment have them on the floor. So I think that's kind of a routine also. So to go look forward, looking through the museum and see that they do you don't have anything on the floor at that time. Uh, we don't have very rapidly flooding is happening. So I think sometimes it's good to have a, there is some alarms that you can see when, when water coming up from the sewage or coming up from water pipes or something. So you have an alarm in, in a storage building or something but where you don't visit it often. Uh, I think that's important because then you can uh, you can see the flooding not after <laughs> half a week or something. I think also one thing that I've learned is that uh, we work together with uh, a fire brigade or something, and they used uh, this, I don't know what you call them in English, but you have in, in the ice hockey, the thing that you're playing with, uh, the, the puck, we call them puck, <laughs> I don't know, the little black thing, uh, that you can put them uh, under wooden uh, furniture so you can use one or two or three on top on each other and then you can get them up because they don't suck water so you can get them up a little bit if you don't oh. have 
a lot of <laughs> that's something that could be a part of emergency kit i think so that uh, could you could you please share that and look for uh, the right term erica i will find the right i started to do it but i will find right but they are they are Thank very you. flat and yeah. you can put them on yeah, top I of think, each other i think i know what you are talking about because i think i've seen it but <laughs> the thing, not the ball but the thing I, you use in ice hockey for i will look it up yeah, they're, they're absorbent bags. Okay, so I hear somebody else saying something. Francois, you have very patiently your hand up. Please go ahead. Um, an important point, I think, is really carefully thinking your packing policy in storage. Um, too much packing is a complete disaster. Plastic boxes are filling in with water and then you can't carry them anywhere. It's sticking the mud on the object and, uh, and it's uh, to, so increasing the damage. And you can also completely miss that you have a water damage because it's rain on the packet. The packet looks dry from the outside and inside it's, it's moldy and wet. So a lot of, of storage, I think that people tend to uh, keep the object packed also thinking that it's easier to evacuate that way, but it's actually increasing the disaster, I would say 99% of the case. One question I have, how much of experience anybody has had with the compact shelving and water going into the compact shelving? Ice hockey pack, yeah, the one that, uh, okay, so you can, yeah, anybody has had any of the experiences with that? Compact shelving and, you know, when the collapsible shelving and then water going in that? I know that what can happen sometimes is that it's it's going to get jammed because the water um, is, is going under the structure. Um, so if you keep your your mobile storage closed during when it's not used and the disaster happened at that point, then you will maybe struggle to reopen them to evacuate. Uh, so that's, that's a, a, a first issue, I think, may probably with them. OK. OK. So. We have spent all the money. We are out of money now, but we we did think very well, and I think this is a collective work of this group, which is uh, we are going to. We didn't don't have time to look at gaps, but let's listen to Francois, and then we will come back to a final discussion on gaps. We'll see how much time we have for an activity, which we had planned for you. Uh, in plain, uh, in smaller groups. But if we don't have time for that, we're going to come back to this discussion and we are going to identify as a group some gaps because if flooding is going to become more frequent, then we want to leave this workshop with some very clear ideas on the way forward. And uh, so let's move on to the uh, presentation by Francois. And I also see Tobias in the, here from Germany and uh, right, I don't see him now. Okay, anyhow, I'd forget, I won't start looking at people, Let's just listen to you, Francis. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so last, last year, around the 14 to 15 of July, there was some um, unusual flood in Belgium and we, we can, consider that as a new type of flood in a way, because it's very unusual to have a static clouds in that area of Europe. It does happen in other places, but not, not uh, usually in that area. And you see here the um, image of the weather forecast and the, the uh, part of the situation on the 15. So it was raining till two days already. And it actually uh, stayed put on an area of Belgium that is usually not impacted with that kind of, of, of level of water. So it was unprecedented. And the link to climate change was very quickly done in the, in the following weeks uh, by the National Weather Forecast um, Administration to say that it was um, above, above and beyond what could be uh, spotted in this area before. Um, so as you see, Belgium is uh, just under that red part of the cloud. Um, and um, the area that was impacted, um, so Belgium is a federal country with three uh, main communities and three languages, and the flooded uh, happened in really the border area here around Liège. And you have here the Flemish-speaking area, 
French speaking area and a little bit of a German speaking area with three different types of administration managing their cultural heritage and their emergency system in slightly different ways already. Now, the event happened in uh, the first month after the reopening of the border that were closed down for more than a year because of the pandemic. So a lot of people left the country for holidays and meeting their families. Um, so there was a lower level of, of um, heritage professional maybe available in the area. A lot of people were exhausted by the pandemic too and were on holidays full stop. Um, and on top of that, the emergency response uh, was restructured in the, in the years, in the last years, and was uh, slightly off um, to, to answer to a crisis of that type. So um, the area is also a former industrial area. You see that that's an historical map of the mining uh, and, and steel activities there. And it's uh, actually at the moment stricken by economic crisis for some, um, some time now and with um, a population that is a bit elderly in the rural area, especially. So a lot of factors that made the, the risk uh, management very difficult and the crisis was uh, due, since mid-July till the end of August, very regularly, the national authorities had, had to take over and try to give back to local authorities the management of the crisis because it wasn't, it wasn't working properly even to simply rescue the people. So on a human level, 39 people died in those floods and 20,000 lost their habitation. So um, that was um, a level of disaster that hadn't happened uh, really um, like that uh, in, in, in Belgium before. Um, and one of the first things we struggled with was to evaluate what was the situation for the heritage in that area. Um, we uh, ended up through the process I'm going to describe uh, listing about 100 listed buildings that were um, highly impacted. Um, 80 other sites, including museum and archives mainly, and about 30 churches. So the first thing we did, uh, Belgium is a, is a federal country and there is a huge culture of um, sharing administration um, levels. And so a lot of the heritage is responsibility is split between various stakeholders. And so uh, uh, very quickly after the beginning of the crisis, we uh, created a crisis committee around the um, IRPA, inst the institute I'm working in, to try to gather all the actors and stakeholders and try to gather information out of that. Uh, it very quickly grew to uh, 14 uh, different administration and, and agencies of all type and associations. And we were organizing a weekly meeting, which were gathering between 20 and 30 people uh, each week during the whole summer. So the impacted area after a bit of um, gathering information, as you can see, really concentrated in around the city of Liège, mostly um, uh, before it. And it was in a, one of the affluent of the big Meuse River. And the other area were impacted, but uh, less heavily. Um, these are mostly, ex except Liège, uh, rural areas. But if that flood had, had happened in those areas, they are very heavily peopled and very urban areas and the level of disaster could have been massively different. So uh, several evaluation tools were put in place. Um, first, um, sort of word to mouth gathering information, a lot of medias were communicating in every direction and social networks too. So first um, we created an Excel sheet and everything that was told to us, especially during the meeting of the uh, committee, crisis committee, was gathered as much as we could uh, that way. And we were growing every week the list of about 20 more sites for a good month. Uh, and then very quickly, we requested a, a ICROM support uh, to put together an evalu a quick evaluation form. Uh, and um, from the, on the 30th of July, uh, we had an online workshop with uh, a partner and, and our team that gathered um, uh, several professionals from the crisis committee to try to figure out what, what the, the evaluation form should be uh, in a way that would be easy to access, so partly online, uh, but also quick to, to fill in. 
and there was a um, rapid damage, damage assessment form for movable cultural heritage and immovable cultural heritage that were produced um, in uh, three languages, so uh, Flemish, uh, uh, French, and English. Um, they were important in very various ways. Um, first, um, because uh, there was a lack of perception of how important it is to evaluate quickly. So even heritage professional couldn't see why they should put their energy in evaluation before rushing on sites. Um, and so there was a, a, a huge impact on um, helping our colleagues to realize why you should split uh, sometimes the way you want to uh, intervene on site. Uh, and then the, what emerged is that uh, there was a huge need of, of those forms for a specific type of, uh, uh, of heritage that were the Catholic churches. Uh, they are actually managed by so about five to six stakeholders. And so everybody thinking the other one has to do it. Um, a series of them were, were in a situation pretty critical after several weeks after the flood, because basic, basic intervention hadn't been performed there. Um, so one of the partner of the crisis uh, committee started to use more regularly those uh, the, the IACROM form, um, and I think what is important to um, to remember from the the, the that experience of uh, rapid evaluation is that it was absolutely crucial to produce figures and that we could use for communication and advocacy to show that the crisis was on a human level, uh, um, very dramatic, but that, that heritage should be also considered. And we could issue several statements and request funds earlier on because we could say, well, there is that amount of sites impacted. And that's what quick evaluation is, 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 is use, really useful for. The second aspect was um, it triggered uh, on-site evaluation. And you can see in the middle of, of that slide, uh, a discussion amongst, amongst people for one of those on-site evaluation. And that's the number of actors and experts you needed to be gathering just to do a rapid evaluation on site because of the variety of the heritage impacted and the variety of the stakeholders involved. And then uh, the last point where the quick evaluation was really, really crucial is that it enabled us to put together rescue missions in an efficient way because once we knew what was impacted, the type of object and the type of issues, then it still took several weeks to gather the right experts that could go on site and effectively do one day missions. It was very short, but at least we were arriving in group with the proper equipment and the proper expertise to, to, to do the work. So, so that's what I wanted to take, tell you about that experience on those floods. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francoise. Uh, I have one question as you were, uh, both you and Estelle were doing this project. And then we will also show the forms. Actually, the, the game that we had uh, thought was that uh, the activity we had thought we could do together as a group is that we'll show the people forms and uh, like different people can see the forms, the assessment forms that you used and try to see if from their perspective and in their context, would these forms work? Uh, but I want to ask you, can you give us one, one specific example where doing an assessment help you to um, actually go and, uh, you know, uh, make treatment priorities and develop treatment priorities and how to do the next steps. So if you can give one specific example, uh, it would be really helpful. Well, we had um, that experience with uh, um, a partner who is in charge of uh, listing and supporting um, religious communities to uh, map out and then uh, list what kind of uh, movable heritage they have in their church. So there were more on sites than we were. So they used the form um, online when they were going on site and we could get straight away first results of what they had seen. And from then we defined with them um, a group of three churches in the same area that really needed to be seen from closer. Uh, so it took us already several weeks 
just to put together the expert team that went on site and have the discussion with the local priests and the, uh, sometimes the owners or the people in charge of maintenance of those churches. Uh, and that already improved a bit the situation. And from those two levels of, of evaluation, we decided that uh, one more church was really um, a bit abandoned and we decided to go on site uh, and and uh, we went, we were about 10, 12 people of different specialism, and we knew that we needed uh, to uh, get some sculptures out of the building, for example, because it wasn't secure enough. We knew that we needed to um, put to dry uh, the fabric collection and, uh, and a lot of archives were actually found on the day. So, but we had paper conservator with our team, so we had the right uh, uh, people to just uh, start at least that, that work because the local population, local authorities were, were absolutely not able to cope with it. Okay, so that's, uh, that's very clear that uh, the evaluation kind of helped to uh, understand the needs on the ground in a way. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Now, uh, I would like to open the floor for questions to uh, Francois. Uh, if uh, there are colleagues from Germany still here, perhaps they can also share their ex experience. Or uh, perhaps Saima, you would like to share your experience from Kashmir. I see that uh, you are joined. The unmute. Yeah, thank, right. thank, yeah. you. thank you, Aparna. I actually had the opportunity of uh, briefly working with Aparna when uh, Srinagar, which is uh, a capital, the capital city of Kashmir, northern state of India, we were hit by um, unprecedented floods in 2014. And we had the you know flooding for about two weeks and more. And the water had un engulfed actually Srinagar city, the valley itself is a low lying uh, region. So we don't have a lot of opportunity for the water to you know naturally drain out. So that is the reason why, and the river Jhelum, the, uh, you know, the most important river of uh, the valley, was is the only way where the you know the water naturally drains out of the valley. So we ended up you know being engulfed in flood waters for over two weeks, and that actually led us to you know led um, to uh, a lot of damage to movable immovable cultural heritage of unprecedented scale, unprecedented absolutely. And I remember I mean we contacted Aparna immediately, but unfortunately because our administration was they had their own uh, ways of working. We kind of delayed the entire process of recovery and rescue and a lot of dam uh, damage was, uh, you know, uh, 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 we, we experienced a lot of damage in our uh, museum collection. And also because Kashmir is a very important, uh, um, you know, center in terms of arts and crafts, a lot of uh, owners of private collections also suffered because nobody expected these floods. We, Kashmir does have a history of floods, but every once in say 50 or 100 years is the periodic uh, uh, or the frequency of the floods that occur in Kashmir. So we had a similar exercise with Ikram and Ikomos, not really with Ikram, but Ikomos. I think Aparna helped us to develop the form. And we did a rapid assessment of all the, you know, movable, not the immovable uh, cultural heritage, but we, because we didn't have access, they didn't give us access to museums. So a lot of um, uh, immovable assets, uh, we went throughout the valley, um, you know, covered the entire area where the flooding had occurred and did a very, very, very comprehensive damage assessment of uh, all the buildings. And then we also developed a very, you know, we developed a brief kind of a first um, uh, user manual of how the owners of heritage properties should uh, um, should handle their um, heritage assets post flood, and also came up with a very detailed manual of, uh, say, for example, if an owner of a uh, uh, of a traditional building has experienced um, uh, plaster loss or has experienced uh, mortar loss, and because of that part or a part of their uh, historic building or heritage house has collapsed, how they should, you know, without compromising uh, the historicity or the authenticity of the building, how they can re-erect the building or rebuild the building 
you know, using traditional materials or the materials that have, you know, collapsed, using, you know, sturdier materials or probably, um, because in Kashmir, you know, the traditional um, building materials were mud bricks or were mud mortar. So mud is actually a very vulnerable um, building material when it comes to water. So that was number one reason why the buildings collapsed in the first place, the hi historic buildings collapsed in the first place. So we also try to kind of experiment with the material, say if we are using mud as a base material, how can we make it more uh, uh, resilient to water? And then propose that, so in future, if, if, if a building is flooded, uh, how can they you know, reuse mud? Because people had kind of become averse to using uh, mud plaster or, or mud mortar. But nonetheless, a lot of damage was already done and a, a large parts of our um, historic neighborhoods have now you know, completely irreversibly transformed. So we had these beautiful colonial houses, British colonial houses, uh, large neighborhoods. They've transformed now because people didn't know or they or the probably the authorities were not proactive enough to you know uh, encourage the people to rebuild in the same way uh, that their predecessors had had built so thank that is my experience thank you aparna thank you saima uh, so actually looking at these two experiences both of you are saying that you uh, developed something post flood you know uh, francois if i understand well from your uh, presentation and Saima, if I hear you well, uh, do you think now after these experiences that you should have developed these forms much earlier? And this goes to, my question goes to all of the people who are attending today. Do you have f uh, damage and risk assessment forms developed for flooding? Um, or first of all, flooding is uh, in your radar as a risk especially now when rain pattern, weather patterns are changing uh, and there is a greater uncertainty. And there is, uh, we have already been talking about the urban flooding phenomena. So are you, are you thinking of developing something already after this uh, workshop or can I have some feedback from the participants? Yeah. My, my brief my experience in Belgium shows that on the spot, people tend to underestimate the importance of doing that quick evaluation. And it, there was quite a lot of discussion to be done because people want to rush on site. Um, but on the longer term, we are now more than six months after the situation happened, we still um, can get a lot of uh, uh, impact out of those uh, evaluation forms. And, that, and it means you need to be ready before the crisis and have your forms ready or know with whom you, you, would, you would do them or, or put them to use before it, it happens. Because when it's on the spot and you have to convince people, you're losing so much time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Erica, you, you had a comment? No. Anybody else yeah. would want to? So can, can I just have a show of hands? or just people telling us, do you have forms? Do you have damage and risk assessment forms? Claudia, um, I'm looking at uh, you know many, many people who have joined us, Samuel, Ziva, I don't know. I, are the, are Ina you says that she has some evaluation done. Okay, so Ina, can you share some example here? Because give us some, some experience. Uh, yes. Um, we have some forms. As, uh, explicitly for water, our more um, largest problem are rain, which is entering in our um, <clears throat> storages uh, because of the uh, lack of maintenance, because there are lots of trees inside and so outside. So we have uh, some evaluation done and some instruction uh, done for this kind of situation, which is very punctual. It's not a global evaluation and so on. So it's about rain, strong rain entering in storage room, how we go to respond and how we are going to do uh, the, uh, the, 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 the solutions and how, whom we have to communicate. So we have this done, but uh, our problem I think is that it's not uh, uh, sufficiently updated 
and not sufficiently trained because this is kind of a response get we if we have the problem we respond to the problem and if the problem is over we forget about this so, so it's just a paper so this is the largest problem because i think if you don't have simulation we did some simulation and we it showed that we are totally unprepared <laughs> so uh, it has to be done like i think every year our recycling every year or every six months and it has to be be, be more global for more risks because they are in the interdependent so i say yes we have but i think it's far insufficient i'm i'm speaking from sao paulo from brazil just for you to know thank you thank you thank you so much because we are going to share these forms with you and uh, i i is there anybody else who would like to comment please it's a last round uh, show up you have joined this uh workshop so please uh, do uh, give us uh, your experience erica raised her hand erica. yeah i think also one thing that is kind of important uh, that we have found out now is uh, to have uh, documentation afterwards and and we visited a place where they have had a uh, flooding in 19, the 1970s, uh, and then after <laughs> many years, they thought that they would like to build buildings, uh, houses there, and then they didn't have that in mind that there has really been a, a, a place that they did a flight in here, so it's not a good idea. And when they could take, they, they can take old photos, they can take old records uh, to to. Advise, give give the proof to them. This is a good, not a good place to build houses in. And I think now we had this summer also not that big uh, floodings that in Germany and, and Europe, uh, uh, southern Europe, uh, but uh, quite big for Sweden. Uh, and and we also have been looking through uh, what we can hand, find out in the in the digital museum. And there are a lot of pictures actually from floodings in the same place. And I think also our authority working with flooding have used some of these uh, sources to, to have, <laughs> have the focus on floodings, that floodings has been a part of this and this and this area. And it has happened here and there and then because it's repeatedly, it's happened all the time. And I think that's also important. So this museum that was affected by the flood now, they have also make documentation of the flooding and want to spread it and want to to and we can also see old sources from it so i think that's also an important where cultural heritage can help totally totally and on that point uh, i would say to also to uh francois uh, i think uh, it would be an important thing to do some archiving and see how how you can take this information long term and to we, inform we have a, we started the we started a project on that because the, the Royal Institute is a, a huge uh, section of historian of art and uh, archivists. So we are now tidying all the data we gathered. So it's turning into turned into a long term archive for the for the institute. That, that's that's uh, wonderful to know. And perhaps uh, Saima would like to do the same. And uh, with that, I would invite uh, uh, my uh, facilitator Mohona to also. Uh, my co, uh, how do you say, workshop leader to just show what do we have in the kit that we have for you. And uh, we will add some more materials, but for now, uh, Mohana, would you like to show what you're going to uh, share with the participants of this uh, workshop? Yes, uh, before that, I see Kiara has raised her hand. Okay, Kiara, yes, Kiara. Yes, I'm sorry, it was just, uh very quick remark. My impression is that from my point of view as hydrologist, mm -hmm. uh, I miss the understanding of uh, the knowledge of people working with cultural heritage to help in setting up some management plans. But from the side of people working with cultural heritage, uh, you are missing the information about probability of occurrence of uh, floodings, of hazards okay. in general. But I mean, the knowledge is there. Our, our community, our, our engineering community is able to uh, evaluate the type of uh, severity of flood and the probability of occurrence. So from our side, we are able to give you the the information you need to manage your structures. So we know that if a flood can happen anytime, but we can tell you 
what what is the probability of occurrence in a certain space and time and we can help you finding the solution but when we work in our large scale analysis then we miss uh, your complementary information so the knowledge is there we just need to cooperate a little bit more i think Chiara, that was a very important point. Thank you for bringing that back because I think that's where we started the conversation from and that's where we should take it back to. One aspect is preparedness in terms of forms and you know all those other things. But to prevent floods in the first place and to better be risk-informed, as you said, risk-informed decision-making, it is very important that this knowledge uh, interchange must happen and unfortunately it is not happening enough uh, you are working in more of a university space and uh, people like uh, Francoise and many of our participants here are actually working in the cultural heritage sector and they are dealing with this issue but uh, with themselves and not uh, really taking uh, use of this expertise that is available and I think uh, the same goes for you because to, to be able to develop site level plans and to understand how water, what would be the severity, intensity of the hazard, hazard mapping, and then overlaying that with vulnerability data would be amazing, right? Yes, but it's possible. I mean, it it's, is possible. It we is have possible. All the, the technology and knowledge and expertise together to match our. Yes, but let's then, then let's as 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 participants of this workshop, uh, uh, let's promise each other that we will try to find people from other uh, you know streams who can help to inform our uh, risk assessments, and we as cultural heritage people perhaps can help in conducting vulnerability assessments. Because we know like uh, what materials we are holding, in which, con which condition we are holding them. Like uh, Ina just shared, like rain comes, the building is bad, water enters, and I have a procedure, right? So we have this information. We just need to bring it together. And I hope uh, those of you who have just kept quiet agree. And you promise me that uh, you will be also sending us some feedback after the workshop. And Moana, perhaps now you can share the what you have in the kit. We call it our kit bag, our tool kit. Yeah, show Moana. You can share the screen. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so we have around five documents in this kit, which Shop. Uh, we have a brief introduction and we have uh, some extracts taken from our first aid uh, yet. Please do. The link is in this document. Um, I think, Mona, your screen is like kind of like, you know, not being. Can you yeah, share again because I think it's not loaded yes, properly. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I think there's too much uh, load on the stream or yeah. something. Yeah. 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 So, and, and uh, Erica has also shared something with us, which is digital. I saw Samuel Franco who was raising his hand. So, in, if you want to okay. continue the discussion. Yeah, so Samuel, last comments. Do, do, do give your comments to us. Finally, you, you choose to speak. Yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, yes, I just wanted to uh, do a comment uh, on the forms uh, because um, I personally have been involved in rescuing uh, different floods and also uh, assessing damage and so on. But I think there are different, as we have mentioned in this session, there are different situations, like uh, it could be urban flooding or uh, in a museum or so on. But I have faced a lot of uh, uh, situations in archaeological sites, which is a different scope. Um, and also in a city that it's sinking, you know, like uh, there's a small island that that the, the water level is raising and so on. So I think uh, we need more tools to part specific cases because they are all different. I mean, flood is a flood, but as we have mentioned, you know, they are all different. 
so uh, I think the, the, the forms that already exist are very useful, of course, but we have to keep on, as it was mentioned before, to updating it every day, every week, like, you know, because uh, in every event, because every event is different. So, um, and, I, and this year, I, I we will particularly be working in the archaeological area, which has facing a lot of uh, floods. So we would like to be more prepared with tools to, or uh, I mean, forms or, or tools to for this particular situation. So I think this session is very useful. So, and, and great you. presentations from everyone. Thank you. We're learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Samuel, and uh, do keep us posted because uh, definitely archaeological sites and again, the typology of archaeological sites, right? It's not only all archaeological sites are similar. As you said, they're very context specific. And also it's, it depends on, uh, you know, what kind of flooding you're looking at and accordingly you can tailor your, and that's why we wanted to play this activity to, you know, basically to get the principle, to grasp the principles on how we can develop, uh, you know, broader level categories and then, you know, categorize and uh, classify some of the data that you're gathering. So uh, just to uh, show you now that uh, we have these, uh, uh, you know, some of the, uh, um, you know, a kit uh, kind of a thing developed in which we have uh, put some of our own publications and uh, uh, like uh, also like how you can look at uh, damage related to floods. And uh, we have also gathered uh, some of the uh, forms and uh, there is a lot of good material also around. So we're going to share all of this with you. We would certainly expect your feedback. We are happy to engage in this dialogue and also help develop uh, context specific uh, you know fee, uh, um, uh, forms and we are very interested in this topic so please uh, stay tuned and as uh, we hope that as of today we have now a growing partnership with Kiara who has uh, said that uh, she would like to forge many such more exchanges and so you also have Kiara's uh, uh, we will see if uh, our panelists, both Francoise and Chiara, Chiara will uh, share their email with us. Uh, with all the participants, we will send all that information to you uh, once we have the formal permission. And uh, so thank you so much for this uh, great uh, exchange, all of you, and goodbye from our side. But we hope to keep in touch with all of you. And um, Mohana, would you like to say uh, last words? And Juhi, would you like to also? So my two facilitators I, and my co-leaders of this workshop, please, the floor is yours. No, I was, uh, as uh, Pranam said, that this is our favorite topic. So I'm very pleased that all of you uh, participated. And I think it was a very interesting discussion. And we are already 20 minutes over time. So it shows that it was a really interactive workshop. I just want to say that we have another parallel session going on. It's a climate open mic. If you wish to join. Samana, you got muted. Ah, sorry. <laughs> So I was just saying that we have another panel going on, another session uh, parallelly. So if you wish to join, please uh, join. And the link is in the chat. And thank you very, very much again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Kira. You. thank, you. thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.